So instead of what would normally be your piping hot monthly Bitcoin digest, I am still going to do that, but I'm going to really focus today on Bitcoin mining because there is a lot going on. Centralization in terms of mining pools is on the rise, and yet there are a number of efforts underway to combat this. Where will all of this net out? Today we're going to discuss. Let's jump in. So I hadn't actually looked at these numbers in a few months, and so I was pretty struck by this post from Chris Bleck, showing that the two top mining pools, so Foundry in the US and then Ant Pool, uh, which is a Chinese pool, comprise 55% of Bitcoin hash rate. And so I confirmed that by going over to the Brains Mining Insights dashboard, and indeed, right, that is reflective here. And the reason that's alarming is a few fold. For one, that number has crept up from probably like 50, 51, 52, even earlier this year. So adding a few percentage points is pretty significant over that period of time. Additionally, both of these pools are KYC, meaning they have the information of who these miners are. Now, if you're brand new to how mining pools actually work, you can check out the video I've done on that exact topic. And we'll get into some of that as we go along here, but it's therefore not difficult to envision how this could become a real issue. If all of the constituent miners within these pools are KYC'd, and furthermore, at least in the case of Foundry, I'm less so sure about Ampool, these are typically like the big, publicly traded US miners, right? Like these are big operations. While it is the case that one of these pools is based in the US, one of these uh, pools is in China, and those two governments uh, don't exactly get along, could there be some sort of coordinated effort to censor certain types of transactions or even conduct some sort of 51% attack? So it's a real issue. Now, sort of the first response that one should have to that is, well, it's quite easy for me to point my hash elsewhere, right? I can basically change my config file on my mining machines to point from one pool to another, and I can do that pretty instantaneously. Check out a whole video I did on proof of work versus proof of stake, where I go into that and a number of other dimensions that demonstrate that in practice, it's not as bad as it sounds. With that said, it should give us all pause. This is not something we should sweep under the rug and sing kumbaya and just sort of hope it all turns out okay. And I would invite you to check out this excellent article written by Bob Burnett. Uh, some of you may know him as Boomer BTC on Twitter. And in it, he puts together this framework of these three categories of miners. And you can see how he's sizing it up, right? Less than 10 servers, you know, maybe one kilowatt to 20 kilowatt hour sites. He calls these, these, you know, wild rabbits, right? And it's easy to see where he's going with this. Rabbits, right? They can scatter uh, quickly if there's a threat. They're difficult to track, at least in numbers. They're easy to hide. They're nimble. They're, they're mobile. Horses still retain a lot of those nice traits, right? They're fast, they can, they can move, they're mobile. They can hide somewhat, certainly less so than rabbits, but then you get all the way up to these really big boys and what Bob calls the captive elephants because these guys are huge. These are 5,000 plus server sites, you know, 20 megawatt to a gigawatt plus. They're slow, it's very difficult to move this it's easy to find them, right? They also tend to be captive in the sense that they're participating in these KYC mining pools. But what if in a future state, economies of scale gradually lead to 99% of the network's hash rate being concentrated in these captive elephant sites? And so in such a scenario, and granted, this is with low probability, Bob even acknowledges that, but that provides the ability to have some sort of orchestrated attack where we're not even talking now about a 51% attack. What if governments collude and remove the power supply that's feeding these sites, right? Which are probably plugged into public utility type infrastructure. 
This could result in a massive share of the hash rate going offline overnight. We're talking China ban 2021, except magnified much, much bigger. So what would happen? Well, it would be, it would take an exceedingly long time to find the next block. And the problem is that the difficulty adjustment happens on a block time basis. It happens every 2016 blocks, which on average is every two weeks, roughly. But when you take all this hash rate off, it could take years to get to the next difficulty adjustment because blocks would be produced at such a slow rate with such a small fraction of the global hash power that's still online. And so yes, blocks would technically still be produced, but it would greatly impact and shake confidence. It would greatly disrupt the network. And he goes into some scenarios here about what that could actually look like in terms of time that it would take. You know, And so again, in summary, it could take over a year to get those difficulty adjustments and get the network back in balance. And so again, there's so many assumptions built into this type of scenario and Bob admits that, and I think we would all acknowledge that, well, there's a humongous amount of concerted effort. Have governments ever been able to uh, coordinate effectively with each other? But again, I do think this is instructive. And while on the one hand, we saw how resilient the network was, when you had the China ban and half of the network's hash rate came offline and the network very rapidly recovered from that, what happened was a lot of that hash rate came to the US and is now plugged into a KYC pool like Foundry. And so if you leave this video with nothing else, I would encourage you to think about how you can support either directly or indirectly the promotion of wild rabbits and horses as opposed to captive elephants. And the good news is that there are a number of efforts underway to do just that. So let's now talk through some of those potential mitigating solutions and what's happening in the world of mining. One big factor is Stratum V2, the second generation protocol that governs how information is communicated from constituent miners to the mining pool operator and so the status quo for the most part is what's happening if you're running a number of asics and you're plugged up to a mining pool really all you're doing is sort of dumbly contributing your hash rate to the pool it's actually the pool that is producing what's called the block template which is defining which transactions from the mempool are actually going to be packaged up into the block and you can see how this could be an issue right if it's just the mining pool all the way up at the top that's defining which transactions make it into a block, that's a very small number of enforcement points for regulators to put pressure and say, hey, you know, you have to include these types of transactions or exclude these types of transactions, etc. And so what Stratum V2 does, in addition to other things, is it enables the constituent miners, the component miners, to produce their own block template. That's a huge deal. Now those miners can still include or exclude whatever transactions they want, but with incentives, you're gonna see a whole range of different block templates. So Stratum V2 definitely helps with censorship resistance in a big way. And excitingly, two newly created pools have now announced that they will be integrating Stratum V2. One is Demand Pool and the other is Ocean Mining. On the topic of ocean mining, let's talk about that because the other sort of solution vector here is the way that these pools are created themselves. And so there's been a whole lot of news lately around ocean mining. For those that may have missed it, ocean mining is basically a revival of the old Elegeus uh, pool that Luke Dash Jr., who's a Bitcoin core dev, uh, ran back in the day, I think from like 2010 to 2017, along with Bitcoin Mechanic. They've made a real splash. They have a $6.2 million seed round led by Jack Dorsey. So there's been a lot of fanfare, particularly given some of the promises that Ocean has made. It's introducing itself as this new decentralized mining pool to address and combat some of the issues we've just discussed. And so some of the claims it makes is that it's very transparent. You can actually go to ocean.xyz slash block template and see the actual block template that is going to be used by the pool. That is very cool. It also claims to be decentralized in the sense that it's promising to implement Stratum V2 for miners to create their own block templates. 
And it's also promising to be non-custodial in that they're doing the Coinbase payout, so the block reward from winning a block, directly to miners. So it's a trustless payout. But there's been a lot of controversy with this launch. And I also think some rather poor communication and marketing on behalf of ocean mining. So let's break down what the truth actually is. In terms of transparency, yes, that is nice. We saw the block template uh, that you can go and see and look at. And furthermore, they've indicated that they would actually reduce the 2% pool fee down to 1% for miners that actually produce their own block template. So they would be providing an economic incentive for you to create your own block template. That is very cool if they follow through with that. In terms of the non-custodial nature, however, it is not clear that that is actually true given that they still have a minimum payout threshold. So for smaller miners, you're probably still going to have to accrue a certain number of sats before they pay you out. And that is no different than any other mining pool. Although they have talked about potentially using the Lightning Network to enable instant withdrawals for smaller amounts, which would be very, very cool. There's other proposals as well, something called Braid Pool, which also seeks to help address that. So it'll be interesting to see what and if Ocean implements any of that. But as of now, it is not any more non-custodial or custodial than other mining pools, unless you are a big miner. And then there has been a whole bunch of debate around censorship and a lot of controversy here. So it was believed that they were filtering out uh, inscription transactions or ordinals if you're new to that whole thing, I have done a whole video on that as well. Then it was revealed that in the block template they were including inscriptions, and so no one knew what was going on. However, they have confirmed, as we can see, that they do intend to filter out inscription transactions. Hoddle Tarantula makes a very good question. He says, well, if I create my own block template and submit it, is that going to get rejected from Ocean Pool? To which Luke Dash Jr. says, absolutely would be accepted. Rejecting blocks miners make would defeat the whole point. He is absolutely right. However, I strongly discourage it. So clearly there's a strong ideological stance here from Luke. Bitcoin mechanic against inscriptions. And even if you don't like the idea of ordinals and inscriptions, I personally think it is still disappointing to see that type of censorship because they could potentially end up hitting themselves in the foot when they are less competitive versus other pools that are gonna put those types of transactions in. Furthermore, it was revealed that the Bitcoin Knots node implementation that's being used by Ocean Mining was actually filtering out Samurai Whirlpool TX zeros. This is the first transaction that is completed when you're entering the Samurai Whirlpool. If you're not familiar with that or with CoinJoin, I've done whole videos on that topic as well. So you had a pretty big backlash from the Samurai uh, community saying, oh my gosh, you know, this is all this censorship. You're doing this deliberately and maliciously. And while at first it looked really bad, it actually turns out as we can see that the knots node implementation has been filtering out transactions with op return greater than 42 bytes for a long time. And so I don't think there's any purposeful filtering for the Samurai transactions specifically, but all of this at least raises the question of, okay, like is, right? Miners can of course do what they want, but is censorship good or bad? It'll be very interesting to see when they do implement Stratum V2 and miners are submitting their own block templates, does Ocean Mining actually accept those templates if they include things like inscription transactions, etc.? Again, we have Luke on record there saying that they will, but I think it remains to be seen because as we can see here, there is some pretty harsh criticism that Ocean is receiving from the OG Bitcoin talk forum. They're talking about, you know, Luke Dash Jr.'s uh, history of poolside censorship. So there is a humongous learning here. Slay all your heroes. Don't take all the hype at face value, nor should you take all the criticism at face value. The truth with these things is often in between Everyone is so quick to draw a conclusion and publish their thoughts on Twitter for clicks and engagement, but take some time to really wrestle with these issues. Ocean mining is neither this sort of perfect shining thing that it was made out to be upon its launch, nor is it this dramatic attack and malicious thing Net-net, I actually think it is moving in the right direction if it follows through on its promises of implementing Stratum V2, respecting the block templates created by its constituent miners, implementing something like the Lightning Network to make 
payouts truly trustless even for smaller miners. If it does all those things, then it is definitely ahead of the game when compared to other pools. And furthermore, this has now kicked off yet more innovation within the mining pool space. We can see here that Public Pool and Seth for Privacy have teamed up to, to enable anyone to spin up a new mining pool themselves which is very, very cool. And I'm sure we will see all sorts of pool concepts coming out of this, which of those will grow to be actually meaningful. Maybe none of them, maybe some of them, uh, but it'll be really interesting to see. And I think the critical part at this point is to have the tools available to create different mining pools with different trade-offs. And collectively, these efforts are going to go towards helping what is yet another risk, which is the fact that we're now seeing these out of band transactions. That means I'm a user and I wanna directly negotiate with a miner to include a transaction into the next block without broadcasting it to the broader peer-to-peer -peer network. This is a huge issue because to the degree that activity happens out of band, we no longer have a truly accurate fee picture, which impacts any sort of layer two like Lightning that is dependent on layer one for channel openings and things like that. It also opens up considerations around MEV or minor extractable value, but we won't go into too much detail there. But in essence, all of these efforts, I think will move the needle in mitigating some of these more structural incentive type potential risks. And then perhaps one final mitigating solution vector to think about is supply chain decentralization. Of course, there are only really two main uh, manufacturers of ASICs. And so I've been very, very excited to see the beginning of this movement around open source ASIC hardware like Bitax, highly accessible using a legit ASIC chip. It's very, very cool if you want to kind of get your hands on one. If you want to, by the way, I would recommend going to Decentral. Um, they're currently partnering with us at Jolt's Rewards, which is the startup I'm a co-founder of for Bitcoin Rewards. So you can get some sats back when you buy one. But again, these are not powerful enough to really move the needle yet but it's very exciting to kind of see where this might go. The more we can open source things like ASICs, the better. So in conclusion, I think these issues are real and I think it is time for the community to seriously think about this and not just sort of kick the can and be like, well, miners can point their hash at another pool. It's like, yeah, that's true, but there's a lot of these miners who are only going to point their hash at a sort of approved pool, i.e. a pool that does KYC. I think that's a somewhat naive and certainly insufficient argument, which is why I think some of these different solutions, definitely Stratum V2, definitely some of the innovation around pools, and then some of the open source hardware innovation that we're seeing with things like Bidax, all of that is going to move the needle and at least start a movement and again, if nothing else, I would invite you to contemplate that framework that Bob laid out. How can we foster and promote more wild rabbits and horses and less captive elephants? But I'm curious to hear your thoughts. What do you think of this whole debate? Are these valid concerns? Is it overblown? What else are you excited to learn more about or see more about in future videos? Let me know in the comments down below. But I hope you found this valuable and insightful. If you did, you already know what to do. Give this video a like, use the share feature underneath this video that really does help get this to a broader audience. And I think we should be talking about this type of stuff a lot more than what is currently happening. And if you are so enamored with this content, you wanna to donate to a pleb, which really does help me continue to make these videos, you can do so in a number of ways. There's the super thanks feature built directly into YouTube. If you happen to have something like Albi, you can just click that uh, browser extension and it'll automatically detect you're watching my channel, which is pretty cool. You can send some sats that way or you can drop some sats to my lightning address, me at www.ianmajor.xyz. Or if you have any issues with that, you can also you can always send it to ragermajor at getalbi.com. And lastly, for those of you that have asked how you can get in touch with me for more one-on-one -on -one type mentorship, advising, consulting, maybe you're starting a Bitcoin business, you're trying to set up a multi-sig, you're running your own node, you're accepting payments for your business, whatever it is, reach out and we can connect. I'm using the Vita platform for that, which is terrific. But we'll go ahead and leave this here. As a reminder, every sat counts. And until next time, I'll see you then.